And he was like, well, we need a little bit of bloodlust so that we can be competitive and so that we can, you know, make sure that we don't lose our standing as humans. Wow. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm super excited to be joined today by none other than Ed Winters, aka Earthling Ed. Ed is a vegan educator whose content boasts over 200 million views, and he has hosted numerous viral speeches, debates, and videos engaging in dialogue with non-vegans and skeptics. Ed has delivered speeches at numerous schools, universities, and major companies, including Google, and he's engaged audiences all around the world. As an activist, vegan educator, and most recently a published author, he is a firm advocate for animals and the vegan lifestyle. Ed's advocacy centers around compassion, empathy, and open communication. In 2016, he funded a grassroots animal rights organization called Surge. Two years later, he launched Unity Diner, a nonprofit vegan restaurant in London, all the proceeds from which go to helping animals. The culmination of that work is his lifelong passion project, Surge Sanctuary, which houses rescued animals on a vast 18-acre property. Most recently, Ed has published his first book, This is Vegan Propaganda and Other Lies the Meat Industry Tells You, which presents an indisputable case for veganism. This is a book that is much for non-vegans as it is for those who already lead a vegan lifestyle, empowering them to talk more confidently about veganism with the non-vegans in their life. The book explores the effects of animal farming across the globe and how they are rooted in a number of factors that have created our current system. I'm delighted to welcome Ed and find out more about the inspiration behind this book and everything that he's been up to with his work recently. I'm Robbie Lockie and this is the PBN podcast. Hello, Ed, and welcome back to the podcast. Hello, Robbie. It's a pleasure to be back. It's great. We haven't seen each other for a while. It's been a minute, hasn't yeah. it? And you've been a very busy man. As of you, but <laughs> yes, we, we, do, we do our best, don't we? Mm, absolutely. So, um, for those who do want to hear Ed's backstory, and if you haven't heard already, please rewind to episode 43 on the PBN podcast, where you can hear more about how Ed got into veganism and all the things that led him to this lifestyle. Um, Ed and I have actually known each other for many years. We met, I think, would you said 2016? About 2016, I think. Yeah. And we crossed paths many times with lots of different projects and events and um, campaigning and all kinds of different things. And we've got lots of mutual friends and being part of the, the London vegan community for quite a while, which has changed a lot, hasn't it? Certainly, certainly so. Yeah. And as I was, we were joking earlier, we're now both professional vegans, aren't we? Certainly seems that way, doesn't <laughs> which, it? Yeah. Which I could never have imagined 10 years ago. No, I don't think it was really a thing, you know, the stuff that we are privileged enough to be able to do now, mm. definitely. So let's get into it. Um, so the documentary Earthlings was a huge catalyst in your shift in consciousness. In your opinion, how important is the role of film, both short and long, in the awakening of humanity, do you think? I mean, I think it's essential. Um, you know, for me, it, as you quite rightly said, the documentary Earthlings was the catalyst for me opening my eyes to the true horrors of what we do to animals and making that change to veganism. So we can't understate, I think, the, or we can't overstate, sorry, the the impact that film has. And I think what's really powerful now is hopefully there'll be a shift from, you know, purely documentary work to you know, almost fiction films, but with a vegan message. I mean, Okja is a great example. So as well as just having documentaries that are, you know, outlining the true horrors of animal farming and the impact it has to our health, to, to the environment, of course, I think there's going to be a shift towards fiction films that are normalizing the representation of vegans and also normalizing that vegan message as well, which I'm particularly excited for, hopefully, mm. in the near future. What are some of the films that really, other than Earthlings, um, kind of take your breath away or really kind of shifted your view over the years? I remember, well, Seaspiracy was a, was a huge one. And Seaspiracy, I think, reminded me to not neglect fishing in my activism, because even as vegan advocates, we can often overlook fish, the suffering they endure, and, and the environmental consequence of, of the fishing industry. So that gave me a wake-up call to say, hey, you know, Ed, make sure that you're not leaving out these often forgotten victims, and there's trillions of them. Mm. And I think Forks Over Knives was a big one for me. When I first went vegan, there wasn't as much content as there is now, but Fox Over Knives, I remember watching that and just being blown away, mm. thinking, my goodness, you know, this is a, a huge, huge problem to our interpersonal lives as well that we don't often realize. And that was a, a huge wake up call. Mm, yeah, I can relate to that. Forks Over, Forks Over Knives is one of the first films I watched shortly after Earthlings as well. I just got a cop, not copy, I just got a subscription to Netflix. And I was blown away by all the knowledge that I kind of, you know, absorbed in that film. I had no idea 
um, of the impact food had, that had on our lives, on our health and uh, chronic disease as well. Yeah. Um, I knew that you know humans have always had a problem with chronic disease, but I never realized just how bad it was when it came to eating animals and the effects it has um, on our bodies. Absolutely. Your 30 minute talk to the British University students went viral in 2018 and has 35 million views across Facebook and YouTube. You've given multiple guest lectures at Harvard University and a TED talk amassing a couple of million views as well. When did you realize that your change in perspective had such an impact on people's lives? And do you ever feel the pressure of responsibility to be doing more and more and more? Oh, certainly. I mean, when we realize the scope of what we're up against, it becomes really easy to feel shame and guilt around the prospect of not pushing yourself to do more and more because every single second these problems are intensifying. They're not going away. They're getting worse globally. Even as mm. veganism is growing, the actual issue of animal farming is, is also growing globally speaking. So it's hard to sometimes find the, I suppose, the reasoning to take that that time. So I do, I do find that that is a pressure that can be applied, but, you know, applied by me more than anything else. Mm. And I guess with the public speaking, I think people really resonate to personal stories. You know, as a species, we love connecting with each other through stories, through anecdotes, through, I suppose, forms of communication that touch us in ways that is emotional, logical, rational, that really touches us in, in our hearts when it comes to how we feel about issues. And I think what we find inspiring, hopefully, is when people can connect with us in a way that we've never really realized within ourselves and when people say things that have this kind of aha moment not because of their journey but because how their journey or how what they're saying relates to mm. our personal and inner feelings about these subjects and that's why i like public speaking and why i like having you know in-person conversations even debates with people mm. is because you can connect with people in a way that we're not used to as humans you know mm. we, we have our own lives and we, we have our you know kind of friendship groups and our social circles but being able to connect with just total strangers and seeing people's reactions and seeing how people respond to what's happening, I think is, it fills me with a lot of optimism mm -hmm. and a lot of hope and public speaking is a big part of that for me, which I, I always have really enjoyed. Have you always been so good at public speaking? And if you haven't, how did you learn? I definitely haven't always been good. Mm. I remember when I was at college and stuff, I do class presentations and I always quite enjoyed them. So mm. I've always enjoyed having that, that element of having space to express myself and be able to vocalize how I feel about things. And I remember the first vegan talk I did was a, a you know a vegan festival in Lincoln. And there was a couple of dozen people in the crowd and I had all my notes printed out and my bullet points and they were there on the table. So I'd wander over and look at it. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling very nervous. And mm -hmm. so it's definitely a work in progress. And the more you do it, the more confident you get. And even now, the more I do it, I, I find myself feeling more and more confident because it's a process of trial, e trial and error. And sometimes maybe I'll say something or express myself in a way and it doesn't work out the way I want to or works out really well. And, you know, you're always just trying to shift your approach and mm. shift the way that you convey the message based on how people respond. Mm. And it's definitely a process of trial and error. Yeah, one of the, the founders of TED <clears throat> said that as a speaker, your role is as a speaker is a quite a magical thing because to be successful at public speaking is to take complex ideas that are really resident within your own mind and brain and turn them into words, hurl them across the room and then hope that the people on the other side can put them all together and connect with you. Right. And you talked about sort of telling personal stories. Um, those techniques and those styles, is that something you learned at school or is that something that you've really practiced um, over the years? Have you done courses? What, has, you know, what have been some of the ways in which you've really honed that craft? I think practicing more than anything. It wasn't something I was necessarily taught I remember being young, I would like to, I did little theater productions, you know, when I was in like primary school, so mm. very young. So I've always kind of had, I suppose, confidence in conversing with people and, and being in an environment where people are, are giving me attention. I've always found relative confidence in that, mm. but it has definitely been practice. And I watched, I went through a period of watching a lot of TED videos, um, watching a lot of YouTube videos about communication, about presentation, mm. oration. So it was just a process of education for me. And, and again, that practice thing is so important, mm. you know, and just putting myself in situations that were challenging and pushing myself to, to do talks in these environments and mm. just building up confidence little by little. Mm. It must be such a great feeling to be able to stand on a stage and share something that you care about so deeply 
and have people connect with you and and sort of resonate with what you're saying. Obviously, on the other side of that is also people that don't like what you're saying. And there are many on there. There are many people out there who don't like what we say when it comes to veganism, animals, animal rights, farming. Um, you know, over the years, you've sat down with many people face to face. Um, in these sort of table over table discussions you've been doing a lot lately in the US. Um, what are some of the patterns or behaviors or sort of things that you've experienced? Can you share any anecdotes from from over the years that, that really stand out for you? I think what's rewarding about those conversations is I quickly realized that people use the same arguments. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm in the UK, you know, Germany, Switzerland, America, Canada, mm -hmm. wherever I've been and had these conversations, people don't have new things to tell me you know really by and large everyone says the same things you know it's a food chain it's a personal choice i mm -hmm. like how meat tastes and that fills me with a lot of confidence because i recognize that most people are just unconscious we're engaged in some sort of autopilot where mm -hmm. we're doing this thing unconsciously and we don't really have any excuses we're just regurgitating the excuses mm -hmm. that we've seen people use online and we've never really critically reflected on the veracity of those excuses so that's definitely filled me with a lot of confidence but at the same time, there are certain things that can happen that make you think, wow, mm. you know, humans, we've got a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. um, especially not to necessarily pick on America. But mm. I find that some of the crazier conversations I have tend to be in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a... You a, mean the strain, the crazy beliefs that people have? Definitely. Mm. Um, there's a lot more kind of a political opinion there mm. about veganism. I think it's a little bit more politically divisive there. I think that there's a religious argument there that we don't necessarily find in more secular areas of the world, like here in the U.K., and I remember, well, there was a conversation I had just recently. This kind of puts it into context about the, uh, the strangeness of some arguments. It was at Texas A&M, which is a big agricultural university. I think it's the biggest university in all of the U.S. Mm. It's in the heartlands of Texas. And so I kind of gone with a little bit of trepidation, kind of an awareness that maybe people wouldn't respond that well. But to be fair, everyone responded really well. But this one guy had a very unusual argument. And what it boiled down to was, he said that eating meat gives us bloodlust. Mm. I said, bloodlust? Surely that sounds like a negative thing. Why would you want that? And he was like, well, we need a little bit of bloodlust so that we can be competitive and so that we can, you know, make sure that we don't lose our standing as humans. Wow. And then it, it kind of, we kept going a little bit further and further. Mm. And he said to me, no offense, no disrespect. And I said, no, that's fine. Whatever you want to say, just say it. Mm. And he said, if the US went vegan, mm. we would become weak. Wow. And then we would be more vulnerable to our enemies, like wow. China. Mm. And I was like, so just to clarify, the reason that we should eat meat in America is because if we don't, America will be overrun by communist invasion. Mm. And he was like, yeah, pretty much. And I was like, that is potentially the strangest argument I've ever heard in my life. Wow. Right? So there is a, a definitely a strangeness to some people's mm. reasoning. That's remarkable, isn't it? How yeah. people's beliefs are so entwined. Um, and that's one of the interesting things about communication. I often talk on this podcast about the the mechanism in which people hold beliefs. And Dr. Melanie Joy talks a lot about it. But, you know, the, the human brain is actually built to protect core beliefs. And actually, when we attack, in quotes, core beliefs in particular ways, whether it's aggressively or with our aggressive body language, the human brain um, actually implements a mechanism to actually protect us. Uh, neuropinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter, actually increases in the brains of people that feel threatened. And neuropinephrine can, can be associated with narrow-mindedness and um, kind of really shutting off from anything new. Right. Um, but when people feel safe and um, uh, kind of confident about a relationship or a conversation, or they feel that you're not a threat, neuropinephrine levels actually drop. Wow. So there's an interesting biochemical biochemical reaction that goes on between two people. And I, and I genuinely believe when you in, in, interact with people in those settings, when you're sitting at a table, you in the book you talk about neutral body language and you talk about how we should be conscious of how we speak and the words that we use because ultimately what we're doing is when we communicate communicate with another person we are using our words but we're also using our bodies some 80 percent of our communication is physical it's non-verbal yeah. and so isn't it remarkable that as we grow as people and as we grow as vegan advocates we can really hone those tactics would you say though some people might say we're manipulating people that we're using psychology to sort of you know evade people's belief systems and because i think some people do see us as forcing our beliefs on other people. What do you say to people who say that? Well, I think vegans can't force anyone to do anything. You know, we have conversations with people, mm -hmm. but what that person does afterwards with what they've learned from that conversation or how they felt from that conversation is entirely up to them. 
You know, I can't follow the people around and make them buy tofu in, right. in supermarkets. So this notion of forcing beliefs is an interesting one. And I don't think it's manipulative to use to be intimately aware of how psychology works and mm. how language and body language is important in in conveying a message. Mm. Because what it allows us to do, if we recognize how there's these certain triggers, these certain things that can happen as a result of us communicating in a negative way, mm. by, by understanding that and then diffusing that by conversing in a positive way, mm. we're creating an open landscape through which these ideas can be objectively discussed. Mm. And I think what happens a lot of the time with political issues, moral issues, is there's a lot of disingenuous conversation, a lot of straw manning, a lot of, mm. a lot of tactics that are used to try and make someone seem extreme or militant or dogmatic, or just to try and ignore the overall messaging. But actually understanding how we can have productive conversations means that the arguments and the debates become solely about the mm. issues and not mm. the, the stereotypes that come along with them mm. or the caricaturing that we can often apply to people who have different views to us. So I think actually it just levels the playing field to the point where we can actually openly and honestly discuss how we truly think as individuals mm. about these really important issues. Mm. Absolutely. And as the Buddha says, and I always say this on this podcast, we've got two ears and one mouth because we should listen twice as much as we speak. Wow. Nice. Because most of the time people in a conversation, in a dialogue or discord are so, as you say, straw manning and they're so busy thinking about what to say next rather than actually actively listening to what the person has to say. Because ultimately a conversation between two people is not, shouldn't be just about trying to win. It's about trying to understand each other, find a common ground. And I found in my advocacy and in my conversations with people that, and I've had similar experiences to you and I was, you know, you were mentioned in, I think your podcast with Nimai about uh, two South African guys um, how you interacted with. It was it in Trafalgar Square? Yeah, it was, yeah. I also interacted with two South African guys in Trafalgar Square and had a very bad experience. I wonder if it was the same guy. Maybe so, yeah. But, you know, that experience really made me think about how I carry myself and, and do I want to be right or do I want to be effective? That's, and you know? what a great, great, great way of phrasing it. It's mm. so true. We can be justified in the things that we're saying, mm. but the things that we're saying might not be effective in un helping mm. people understand those, you know, what we're trying to convey. So you're absolutely right. It, it is also this, there's all these extra considerations that we need to apply to these conversations. And for me, there's always the element of accountability of, of me saying to myself, who am I doing this for? Mm. You know, if I'm doing it for myself, to, for my own gratification, then sure, you know, laying into someone and telling them exactly, you know, what, why what they're doing is so wrong and immoral and, you know, using very, I suppose um, judgmental language mm. made me feel you know, gratified as an individual. But if I'm there to represent the animals, then I need to do what's most effective for them. Mm. And having those open conversations and being honest and listening, because how can we debate someone if we don't understand their point of view? Mm. So I, I absolutely agree that listening is such a fundamental part of conversation, especially with the table debates, because I'm inviting someone to come and tell me their opinion. Mm. So the prerogative is on me to listen by the virtue of me inviting them to come and tell me their opinions. So if they sit down, I just tell them all my views and all my opinions, but that's not the point of the debate and mm. the point of the table. Mm. I'd like to turn on to the topic of language and the words that we use and the power that words actually contain. Um, words are not just symbols on a page, they contain a lot of meaning and nuance as well. Um, and some vegans or some advocates might use words like rape or murder um, or rapist or murderer. And there's a lot of nuance, nuance in the way these words are used, the context in which they're used. Um, has your views uh, in the way that we use these words to describe what happens to animals changed over the years? Or do you remain resolute as some do that killing animals is murder and that the dairy industry, you know, is a, is a sort of you know, legalized rape system. Um, do you have any sort of thoughts on, on the way we use these words in the movement? Well, I think we can use words in, in different scenarios. And I think that there's a difference between a word being true or, you know, being correctly applied to a situation and us finding justification to use it. Mm. So, you know, I think putting a pig in a gas chamber is murder. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that is what it is. It's, you know, forcefully and unnecessarily taking the life of someone else mm -hmm. Um, against their will. Mm. That, that to me is murder, but I, I'm not going to use that necessarily that word in, in a conversation because I don't need to convince the other person I'm speaking to that this word murder is, mm. is what it is. I just need to convince them that doing this is wrong. Mm -hmm. So f for me, it's more about like getting people to understand the broader point. And when I first went vegan, I'd have probably thought that some of the words that we mm. can use as vegans were wrong and were extreme and were militant to use because I was still understanding the concept. I was still coming to, <laughs> you know, to to grips with everything that we do and, and, and my personal feelings about it. But I'd just gone vegan because I knew that what we were doing was something that, that we shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I'm less concerned about the the words that we apply in terms of their their in, I suppose objectivity, but more about how these words will be perceived. Mm. And if I'm having a conversation with someone, I use a word which then dominates the conversation and whether or not that word should be used. And we're kind of speaking past each other. Right. Because what's important to me is them acknowledging that this is something that should be, we shouldn't be partaking in. Mm. And, you know, slaughter and words like this are very emotive words as well. And people can't argue with those in the same way that they can with some of the more emotive, even more emotive words that we can use. Mm. So language is very important. Um, and it's not betraying our views. It's not betraying our feelings. It's not betraying the animals to use language that we know will fulfill productive dialogue. It's actually the opposite, because like I said, we don't want to get bogged down in theorizing the legitimacy of certain words and mm. open up the dictionary to see if it you know, matches correctly. Mm. It's about conveying the basic principles, which is that morally speaking, what we do to animals is wrong. Mm. And regardless of the labels or words we use to that, you know, to apply to what we do to animals, mm. that's just an objective fact that needs to be mm. addressed. Absolutely. And I think most people agree that causing unnecessary suffering to animals or any suffering to animals is is intrinsically wrong. And when you ask most people that, 99% of people will say, absolutely, it's wrong. Um, a shift in perspective or what I often like to call is, of, is an unlocking of realization um, seems to be an essential part of people awakening to the suffering of animals. Um, why do you think some people make this connection overnight? and other people seem to take years and years for it to get through to them, despite seeing earthlings, despite, you know, being exposed to this abhorrent system of, of, of violence that animals have to endure. Why, there's, why does it seem to be such a difference in people? Yeah, it's a really good question. In mm. many ways, I suppose it's the million dollar question, isn't mm. it? Like, how do we, you know, create um, a form of messaging that gets everyone to make that realization immediately. The truth is humans are complex beings, right. psychologically speaking, very complex. And we have different personalities, different ways of processing information based on how we were raised and all these external factors that we don't necessarily as individuals ultimately have that much control over. But these things could impact how we perceive information, how we you know, act according to the information that we mm. receive. So I think we have to understand that humans are very complex and that ultimately, there can be differences in how people hold themselves accountable. You know, mm. people, some people will, will hold themselves, you know, solely accountable straight away, mm. recognize that they have this impact and that they need to change. And so they do. And then some people will try and deflect accountability. Now, it's not my fault. We should, you know, the, the government needs to step in and change the, the practices. You know, it's nothing to do with me. You know, I'm just one person. I won't make a difference. And so there's this denialism that can creep into people where, maybe there's an element of guilt mm. and rather than acknowledging the guilt and changing they feel the guilt and then try and deflect it so that everyone else's problem but but theirs so i think that i think that what we have to do is create a system of repetition because mm. even the people who change overnight probably in, in almost every case that isn't the first time they've come across this mm. information i think what we sometimes don't recognize is even as vegans we might have this one aha catalyst mm. moment but there's been so many things that have happened throughout history that have led us to that point you know, for me, earthlings made me go vegan, but the chicken truck crash that made me go vegetarian helped me get to that point. Mm. And even before then, seeing blackfish right. made me recognize things about animals. So there were all of these moments throughout my, my life that led me to this point. And so mm. earthlings was just the final piece of the puzzle. Mm. But I, I see it as being the catalyst, the big catalyst. Mm. So even for people who maybe see earthlings and don't make the change, mm. that's why repetition is really important because right. without repetition, we can forget things. So mm. constantly saying the word vegan, people constantly seeing vegan food, vegan arguments, mm. just normalizes it. And the more they hear it, the less they can deny it. Mm. Which leads us nicely onto your new book. Yes. This is Vegan Propaganda and Other Lies the Meat Industry Tells You. Would you say that we need more vegan propaganda? <laughs> no, well, <laughs> what we need and what we desperately mm. are striving to do is mm. cut through the misinformation mm. that has been perpetuated and has been perpetuated for decades right. and reshaping the narrative that has been fed to us for so long. And, and that's what I think this vegan propaganda thing is about. It's about leveling the playing field. Mm. And it's about saying, look, this is what the scientific community is telling us. This is what the medical community tell is telling us. This is what our moral intuition is showing us. Right. It's time to listen to that and not, and not the meat industry funded stuff that we've been gobbling up for, for decades. So tell us a little bit about the book itself. First of all, this very curious title. Yeah. Where did the idea come from? And just tell us a little bit about like, you know, how long the book took and the whole really story behind it. The title, yeah. It's people, I mean, I love the title and it's something that we and some, myself and the publishing team mm. had a lot of back and forth about. 
this this phrase vegan propaganda was suggested because I'd used it actually in a video I made about seaspiracy. Right. I kind of said, you know, is it vegan propaganda or is this, you know, is it, <laughs> is it truthful? And uh, someone had said, you know, this phrasing vegan propaganda is so interesting. Can we incorporate mm -hmm. into the title? And I was like, absolutely, we should because the animal farming industry has always like to smear what we say as being mm. this misinformation propaganda. Yeah. And I think what, what I like about it is it's inviting people and saying, look, this is the information that these industries are trying to, to tarnish. This is the, in, this is the information they want you to think are, is lies. Come and have a look for yourself, check the citations at the end of the book and decide whether or not this vegan propaganda mm. actually has some veracity to it. And so we wanted to kind of like tongue in cheek kind of disarm this yeah. phrase that the farmers like to use and say, come in and have, you know, read for yourself and find out what you think mm. um, because it's not misinformation. It, it's the opposite. And I think what people, everyday consumers might fail to recognize is that when farmers say that vegans are spreading misinformation, they're not actually criticizing vegans. They're criticizing climate scientists mm. and, and doctors. And they're criticizing kind of our moral compass because right. they're calling this peer reviewed meta-analyses, all, all this, reputable scientific literature that has been published over and over again they're saying that that is a lie mm -hmm. and we're just because vegans are really just vessels for you know talking about these ideas and merely regurgitating the information that's been fed to us through the scientific method and through this this moral intuition that we have mm. yeah you mentioned misinformation there it is a real problem on the internet in, in many areas whether yeah. it's health whether it's politics whether it's the climate crisis there is a lot of information out there that is just plain wrong. Mm -hmm. um, let's just establish first the two types. There's misinformation, which is information that's accidentally passed on by people like you and me, mums and dads, grandpas and grandmas, anyone really who sees something, they they sort of uh, instantly trust it because maybe a friend shared it with them and then they send it on. And so you get this false information spreading. And a, and a study done by Twitter showed that false information actually spreads six times faster than true information, just often because of the way it's packaged and the way it's created. And then there's disinformation, which is purposefully created from the source, whether it's vaccines, whether it's animal rights, whether it's farming. There are people out there who are paid to create misinformation. And on the topic of veganism and animals, there is a man who I often speak of called Rick Berman, who is uh, the founder of the Center for Consumer Freedom in the US. Mm -hmm. And him and probably many other people are paid by the meat industry to create books, billboards, ads, TV ads, magazines, you name it, working like we do as communicators to try to maintain the status quo. Now, they have billions and billions and billions of pounds behind dollars or pounds behind them. Do you ever sometimes look at this and think, how are we ever going to manage to get through to enough people? Because these industries are so big and so heavily funded. How are we ever going to have that um, David and Goliath yeah. situation going on? What's the rock that we can throw at the industry, at the monolith to, to ultimately bring it down? Is that even possible? Well, we hope so, don't we? Um, yeah, the Rick guy, I've, uh, I'm, I'm aware of him. Actually, there's a film called Thank You for Smoking, which I think is about him, or it's like a caricature of him because mm. he's done work against uh, drink, you know, in favor of drink driving. Yes. You know, he's just, he's really- Dr. Evil. Dr. Evil, <laughs> like how he sleeps at night, I guess we'll never know. So there are people out there, and I guess the issue that we have is, as you say, these industries are very well funded. Mm. I mean, there's a guy called Dr. Frank Mitlerner, who's based out in, in UC Davis in California. Yeah. And again, he is a propagator of disinformation. And then, you know, as, as a consequence of that, this misinformation floods the social media and, and convinces people that farming animals is not as bad as we've been told it is by actual peer-reviewed meta-analyses and such. Mm. So I guess, what do we do? I guess we just have to be conscious of the information we're sharing. What we don't want to do is fall into the trap of accidentally sharing misinformation as well. Right. And, and we shouldn't kid ourselves into thinking that everything there is about veganism that is true. Mm. There's misinformation that can be perpetuated by vegans. Yeah. And so we just have to be hyper aware of what we're sharing and make sure that we are hyper vigilant mm. in sharing stuff that is objective and, and factual. And then hopefully over time we can break through these things. I, I guess fundamentally, these industries are also against the against the wall in the sense of they are trying desperately to change something which is inevitable. Mm -hmm. I mean, Klaus did a great talk yep. where he was talking about lab-grown meat yeah. um, and the future of food. The writing's on the wall. The writing's on the wall. Mm. And consumers, by and large, I don't think are too interested in getting bogged down in the theorizing of these issues. Mm. I think what we need to do is just show people why veganism is, is a, a worthwhile pursuit, and that's very easy to do. And then at the same time, people need accessibility. 
And as soon as the market is flooded with affordable plant-based alternatives, with whether it's cell-cultured meat, 3D printed meat, plant-based meats, or just whole plant foods, mm. whenever it's there and it's affordable and accessible, I think people just need to be given some reasons as to why they should pick that up. Oh, that is better for you, better for the health, better for the environment, better for animals, of course. And I don't think people are too bogged down into you know methyl cellulose and all of these <laughs> these terms and these ingredients that mm. people are trying to smear plant-based foods with. Mm. You know, so I think that there is just this disenfranchisement that people can feel and i guess people can hold their hands up and say look i'm not bothered but look here's a a piece of meat that was created using you know cells with no animal was slaughtered it's better for the environment and probably the same for my health if not better why wouldn't i buy that if it's more affordable as mm. well and as soon as we reach that point it doesn't matter what what rick or any of his cronies do they can't stop people from just making those logical decisions mm. so we as vegans now just need to create and facilitate a society where these things will be welcomed right. and that that is happening it is yeah the food tech industry especially here in the uk is incredibly exciting we just and also just across the globe as well we published a story just yesterday about a tech startup in israel who have launched the very first boneless salmon fillet and I sent you the video, didn't I? And it is remarkable. It's even got all the the marbling. Um, and I can't say how much, but I know that they have in, received a huge amount of investment um, by a, a, an undis undisclosed investor who tried the product and was completely blown away and has given them, you know, quite a substantial amount of money within within the first few months of, of starting because he's very clear that this is product is going to revolutionize the, the salmon market, which is like a $50 billion global market. Right. Um, it just makes sense if you can eat a product, if you can eat something that you love like meat, but not kill animals, it just makes sense to make that switch. And of course, as you mentioned, you know, people like Rick Berman, who are him and many people like him are trying to smear plant based meats because they're suggesting things like it's not natural, it's yeah. not healthy, you know, the appeal to nature fallacy, right, which just suggests that consuming things that are not natural is not natural and that it will potentially kill you. But if anyone's checked what's in your beef burger or what animals have to be injected with for you to consume them, you probably wouldn't want to eat them right so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a strange one but going back again a little bit to communication so so you've spoken at length about your style and your communication techniques and tactics and you know the way you talk to people over the years has changed uh, from my perspective of you know I've been your friend for many years of seeing the way you've evolved and the way you speak who are you in the beginning and who are you now and how much has really changed in the way you you where you communicate as a person I like to think that a, a lot of a lot has changed mm. because change hopefully symbolizes progression yeah so when i was at the start i think my my arguments were probably weaker i didn't understand the arguments maybe as much you know i hadn't come to to realize people's motivations and i think that's a really important thing is understanding people's motivations behind what they say so i think it's obviously at the beginning when we, we go vegan we have a lot of emotion and it's righteous emotion you know mm. we're, the, we're righteous and feeling uh you know upset and mortified and yeah. frustrated and the problem is that can kind of translate into thinking that people's motivations are bad and that they're bad people because they engage in bad things. And for me, the realization that good people do bad things and someone isn't wholly bad just because they partake in, in, in some bad things, of course, was quite groundbreaking because I realized that people's motivations weren't that they relished the prospect of causing harm to animals or that they were you know, gleeful about the environmental degradation that was caused by it. Mm. But actually, there's this complex social, psychological uh, kind of baggage behind everyone that's driven to them this point to this point of understanding. Mm. So for me, having that understanding that people's motivations and, and people's reasoning for using the arguments they're using aren't necessarily bad, but have just come from this you know historical baggage that we all come with, mm. was quite liberating because it gave me the opportunity to try to empathize with people. Now, empathy doesn't mean agreeing. It doesn't mm. mean uh, not holding people accountable. It doesn't right. mean just accepting what people say. It just means understanding why people say it and mm. then having, I suppose, respect to respect to them and, and uh, in effect then formulate ways of communicating that are respectful but also show that what they're saying is, is wrong or is at least shouldn't be held up as a moral uh, excuse let's say so that that definitely helped me and then having that process of practicing um, you know, putting myself in situations where I'll go to a university and have, you know, a queue of people waiting to talk to me, each mm. with their own eagerness to try and debunk me. Wow. I think having that kind of, um, I suppose, baptism by fire scenario <laughs> made me feel, word. yeah, right, made me feel more confident. That mm. kind of exposure therapy, if you like, by mm. saying, look, I'm going to have all these strangers and I don't yeah. know what they're going to say to me, yeah. but they're going to sit down and, and kind of like stress test Was my Was that arguments. thrilling or terrifying? 
<laughs> a bit of both, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's thrilling. Um, and I always feel inspired because people, you know, I think people, most people are kind to people. Mm-hmm. And it's very rare that I have someone sit down who is, you know, angry and, and just, you know, wants to see me, you know, like shrivel up or whatever. Right. People uh, are often, more often than not at least, open to having just very good dialogue. And people are inquisitive, you know, mm-hmm. they want to learn and they want to hear my side of the argument as well. And so, I find that after a day of these these table debates, I feel very optimistic. And it's not even that necessarily everyone there has said, you know what, Ed, you're right, I'm gonna be vegan. It's just that having a conversation where someone leaves with, more, with a more positive impression mm. of veganism is really wow. important because I think vegans can have an optics problem. Mm-hmm. And that's not, not necessarily our fault, but right. people think of us as being militant. You know, we have no sense of humor, we're devoid of fun and happiness. And, you know, we just want everyone to fulfill this dogmatic worldview that we have. And mm. I don't think that's a fair representation of us, but people have that. And so by having someone sit down, half of the problem is just changing their perception of what being a vegan means or who a vegan is. Mm. And the other half is, of course, convincing them the arguments behind of the arguments behind veganism. So if I can sit down and have a friendly conversation with someone and, um, you know, leave them with a more positive impression of being a vegan, then I've done 50 percent, I perceive, at least of, of the, the battle. Mm. And I always think that the best thing you can do is build up a little bit of a rapport. Right. So when someone sits down with me. Um, you know, the camera operators checking the batteries, checking the microphones, doing all the checks. Yep. And we kind of take a little bit slow because I want two minutes just to interact with someone. You know, what's your name? Where are you from? What are you studying? Do you like your studies? What do you want to do when you graduate? Mm-hmm. Are you going to move to somewhere else? Are you Are going to live here forever? So just getting to know people and instantly showing them this isn't some sort of gotcha thing. Right. I'm not going to put up a video where I, you know, I, I edit people up to make them look silly and then say destroyed. You know, <laughs> that's not my motivation here. Mm-hmm. So I think just having that kind of honest moment of where I just interact and show, look, there's nothing to be worried about. This is just a friendly conversation. You don't need to, you know, and, and back to me as well, I can establish that this person is also going to be friendly friendly with me mm. just puts us on a level playing field and little things like that have definitely progressed over the years and just me finding more confidence in myself mm. and more confidence in, in my arguments yeah. has definitely led to me I think being more effective hopefully absolutely I think you've come such a long way and you know watching you with people and you know smiling and laughing and sometimes wanting to cry at some of the experiences you've experienced has been uh, really inspirational and you know I've, I've really loved watching your journey so thank, thank you for you, all those conversations well, thank you Robbie. very effective um your book in your book you talk about being vegan or not being vegan as a moral question if the baseline is that we don't want to cause harm to all animals just as we wouldn't want to cause harm to dogs and cats and other pets then how could we continue to consume meat and say that farming animals isn't cruel some people say some farmers say that it is it isn't cruel that it there's it's a huge leap to suggest that all farming is cruel do you feel like farmers and people in these industries are willing will, willingly shutting their eyes blinded by culture or do you feel like our whole species really just suffers some kind of sort of collective denial when it comes to the reality because all you have to do is spend any time in a factory farm knowing that actually some 97% of most of the meat that we consume in this country in the US is factory farmed why do you think there's just so much sort of denial to the reality of what's going on? I think because accepting it means that we have to change. Mm-hmm. You know, accepting it, it's not, an, not only that we have to change, but that we then have to reflect on the fact that the way we've always lived has caused all this suffering and, and was never moral. You know, for us, especially now in the context of, of the society that we're in at least, obviously different in the past when we had to to survive, you know, eat meat, but now we don't have to. So not only would that realization mean that we have to change, but it causes us to reflect on who we are as people. Mm. Are we moral? You know, mm. who are we? What do we represent? What are our values? Because right. that's the thing about going vegan is it, it opens our eyes up to the prospect that we haven't necessarily been as moral as we'd like to have been. And that mm. can open our eyes to other systems of oppression, other things that we partake right. in that maybe we shouldn't be partaking in. So it's a catalyst for change beyond just what we do to animals, Mm. at least hopefully it should be. I think that farmers are an interesting section of society because farmers are very insular. You know, for most of us being raised in cities, we'll have multiple social groups. We'll probably go to a university in a different city and interact in different ways. And we'll, you know, being in cities, there's a diversity hopefully that comes with that, a, a difference of opinion. But farmers, because they live in more rural areas, their social groups are more isolated. They have less capacity to be around people that disagree with them. And of course, farming is a, 
an ancestral thing. Mm -hmm. You know, not many people get into farming for the first time. Right. You know, people who are farmers now, their <clears throat> parents were probably farmers. Their grandparents were probably farmers. Maybe their great great grandparents were farmers as well. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole lineage there. So not only does that come with the consistent perpetuation and normalization of these ideas, but at the same time, it also comes with a huge amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, am I going to be the one? to say, I'm no longer gonna be part of this thing that's been part of my entire family tree. A bit like abdicating from the royal family. Oh, exactly, and, and we know that doesn't come without <laughs> consequences as well, right? So there is this, I think, huge amount of pressure that, that is put on farmers as individuals, mm -hmm. you know, shame and guilt. And then on top of that, if they were to even think for a second that what they were doing was so immoral, which it is, mm -hmm. now they've got so much pressure. So there is this willful ignorance that undeniably must occur. You know, we say that we're against animal cruelty, and if you ask someone to name an example of animal cruelty, they'll say, oh, I don't know, like kicking a dog, right? Mm. Or punching a cat, which is undeniably cruel. But if our criteria for animal cruelty is as simple as kicking a dog, then what does forcing billions of pigs in a gas chamber constitute? Mm. You know, if it's cruel to hit one cat, then how is it not cruel to cut the throats of billions of cows and cattle and sheep and chickens and fish and all these other animals? So we do have this inherent paradox between how we view our relationship with animals and what our relationship actually is. Mm. I mean, ironically, there's this huge disparity where as a society, we probably think that animals deserve more moral consideration than we ever have at any point in our history. And yet currently we cause more suffering to animals than we ever have at any point in our history. Mm. So the, the attitudes of, of how we feel towards animals and the reality of what we do are becoming more and more opposite and paradoxical because we think we're becoming more compassionate but the globalization and intensification of animal farming and the growing intensification means that actually we're causing more suffering than we ever have. Mm. So there is undeniably a paradox there that needs to be addressed. Mm. Of, of all the sort of many interviews that you've had and all the farmers that you've spoken to, have your views and attitudes towards these people evolved over the years? Yes. Mm. Um, I used to think that all farmers were probably these evil people, these bad people. But I think there's a difference between the everyday farmer, you know, someone who, as I said, has been raised in these families, this, this tradition, this history for you know, all of their life and, and lives beyond them, and then the people who are propagating this, this misinformation. So these people who are, who are at the top of the NFU and the AHDB, who are responsible for perpetuating these lies, who are using money from the meat industry to fund studies that they then, that they then disseminate using their PR teams. Mm. You know, these people are doing a disservice to the farming community that they're supposed to represent because they're feeding them with these lies that are making them feel more solidified in their views. What, what's happened, I suppose, is there's this idea that vegans and farmers can't coexist or get along. When actually what we need is the recognition that vegans and farmers can work together to create a better system. Mm. You know, I think the everyday farmer would like, I'd like to hope at least, would think that what they're doing is sustainable and ethical, which gives me the idea that they want a sustainable and ethical farming system. So now what we need is an honest conversation about why what they do isn't sustainable or ethical, and then how can we create something that is mm. actually sustainable and ethical? But the problem is these farmers who have these views entrenched to them with all the baggage that we've just discussed, are being or having these lies perpetuated to them by the people who are representing them, these unions and mm. these levy boards that they fund. And so, that's, I think, where the, the evilness of the farming industry comes into play. You know, these people who have positions of authority and power who should know better and do, and do know better. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the heads of the NFU know that rainforests in South America are not being destroyed for soy milk and tofu, but are being destroyed to feed the chickens and pigs and dairy cows. They know that, but they're more than happy to go to the press and say with a straight face, our vegans are destroying the rainforests. With their avocados With their and their exactly. soya mints. And they know better because these aren't unintelligent people, quite the opposite. They're intelligent people who are using their intelligence to manipulate people in a way that isn't mm -hmm. fair, in a way that is propagating lies, and in a way that is holding us back from actually creating what would truly be an ethical and sustainable food system. One of the ways um, the meat industry or the various animal product industries prop up ailing consumer confidence in animal farming are things like red tractor, yeah. Uh, you talk about it in chapter three. Um, what are some of the best ways in which we can expose the truth behind these labels? Because um, they are pretty insidious in the way they work. They give people almost like the confidence to buy an animal product under the guise that the animals have died nicely or been treated well. Yeah. You know, should we all be coming under undercover investigators or what's the what's the way we can deal with this? 
we just have to recognize what's what's there in front of us. You mm. know, it, when you do a little bit of digging into the Red Tractor scheme, you realize that it's not worth the ink it's printed with. Mm. It is a, a, a truly disgraceful scheme that was set up by the animal farming industries. It's owned by the NFU, right. by Dairy UK. So the very people it's supposed to be holding accountable are the people who own it. And if you look at the board of directors, one of the board of directors is also a CEO of one of the most powerful meat lobby groups in the UK. Wow. Another one is also the agricultural director of Avara Foods, who are the biggest producers of poultry meat in, in the UK. And so these are the people who are creating the guidelines, who are on the board of directors for the Red Tractor Scheme, which is supposed to reassure us that animals are treated with kindness and compassion, yet they're also the people who are making you know billions or, you know, as an industry off mm. of the exploitation of animals. There was an investigation done by the Times which showed that fewer than 0.08% of audits were unannounced. I mean, that's absolutely staggering. That's insane. Which means that the farmers who have been audited are, are told, oh, we're going to come around and inspect your farm on, on this date at this time. Okay, Giving well, them ample opportunity to clear up any misgivings. Right? Exactly right. Mm. So lo and behold, everyone's reassured and we're told that these farms are fine because the Red Tractor Scheme has right. been there. But the Red Tractor Scheme is auditing farmers who fund it through their memberships and through, through the union memberships. And it's auditing farms owned by people who sit on the board of directors of Red Tractor. Mm. I mean, how does that create impartiality in, in audits? It's like the foxes being put in charge of the chicken coop. Exactly. And being asked whether they should have tighter locks or not. Exactly right. <laughs> I mean, that you kind of, yeah, that's such a great way of putting it. And so the Red Tractor scheme basically is a facade. So mm. it's trying to convince us that these animals are treated in a way that's substantial. But actually, most of these practices and regulations that Red Tractor, you know, encourages people, farmers to have are just the legal laws anyway mm. that this is just what's been enshrined by our legal system so red tractor doesn't even really go beyond what's preordained already by the legal system that we have by mm. by the laws so right. and and it, we see time and time again farms being investigated you know red tractor approved farms because most of them are in this country we see time and time again them that they're investigated and time and time again not only are they breaching red tra tra tractor standards they're breaching legal standards mm. and of course what they're doing is is incredibly immoral to begin with and yet we're still sold this idea that these are one bad farm you know it's mm. one bad apple but at a certain point we have to recognize that it's not the apples that are rotten it's the whole tree mm. the roots are rotten and the only way to stop it is to, to pull up the roots and start again and and that's what we have to do not think that these labels mean anything because they don't mm. we have to understand that objectively speaking outside of the legal system there's no right way to do the wrong thing mm. you know if we look at gas chambers for example gas chambers are you know seen as this humane method of killing animals well back in 2003 the uk government's own animal welfare committee said that gas chambers should be phased out nearly 20 years ago wow. but now we kill nearly nine out of ten pigs in the gas chamber the majority of birds are killed in gas chambers 20 years ago nearly we were told that they should be phased out on welfare grounds but they've just been created more and more and we're told that these are humane for those who don't know what a gas chamber is because obviously it might convey images of people in gas chambers what actually is a gas chamber in the context of animal agriculture yeah. Well, th th we have pig gas chambers and we have poultry gas chambers. And so with the with birds, they're normally taken straight from the trucks in the kind of crates they're transported in and put into these big kind of, yeah, I mean, it's like a, just like a big thing, like a chamber mm. that is filled with carbon dioxide. With pigs, they're lowered into kind of like metal gondolas, which are lowered into this pit, again, filled with, with CO2. And in the UK, the kind of mix of the CO2 is, is normally over 80%, which is highly aversive you know, causes um, not only the panic of suffocation, but causes a, an aversive, painful reaction with the acidification of moisture mm -hmm. with these pigs. So they're enduring a painful experience whilst also suffocating and the panic and fear that comes along with that. And so, yeah, they're just these big pits that pigs are lowered into, two or three pigs at a time, filled with CO2 that obviously causes them to suffocate to death whilst also experiencing pain. And it's a similar thing for chickens. So they are just absolutely obviously terrible i mean how we could ever say that these things are humane mm. just shows how i suppose detached we are from what we do to animals you know because the word humane means having or showing compassion or benevolence mm. if we call someone a humane person you know needlessly killing someone else is the last thing that person would be doing because being humane means being compassionate right but how is putting an animal in a gas chamber how is cutting their throat compassionate or kind mm. it's the opposite of these things and yet we're consistently sold this lie 
that what we do to animals is this very, you know, mutual experience where the animals are happy and have this wonderful life and then they die consensually and peacefully and nothing could be further from the truth than, than that. Mm. That leads me on to my next question, which was very simply, can there ever be such a thing as a happy farm animal? No. I mean, obviously animals, some animals raised in farms will have experiences that might be, you know, okay for them, such as grazing cattle, you know, pasture raised animals may, you know, have, you know, a significant portion of their life where they're doing things that they would like to do. But this happiness is, is a state. It's not just a temporary thing. And so for even these sy systems of farm, which are more idyllic and more quote unquote humane, there's still basic things that are required within animal farming. A lot of that's mutilations, forced impregnations, separations of babies from their mothers, and ultimately slaughterhouses. And so even with these outdoor raised ruminant animals, they live a fraction of their lifespan, and then they're killed in a slaughterhouse. You know, there's no happiness and exploitation. And if we really want to prioritize the happiness of animals, then we need to act in their best interests, which we don't. We act in the best interests of us, the consumers, but also the farmers who want to profit from these animals. And so whilst our intentions are to exploit and profit from the bodies of someone else, we're not facilitating true happiness for these animals, even in systems that may, we may perceive to be more beneficial than, of course, the factory farming systems that we all recognize are, are truly despicable. Mm, absolutely. Farming has um, been given a romanticized view for generations. We've talked about it before. Um, when asked to picture the average farm, most people visualize rolling green hills and sheep grazing nonchalantly on the grass. Um, but the reality is that much of the landmass on Earth today is used and taken up by farming. Um, practices that spew huge amounts of methane, nitrous oxide, and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, not to mention destroying and poisoning rivers across the planet, quickening the warming of our planet, and of course, potentially our ultimate demise. Um, COP26 was the global summit on climate change, which concluded recently in Glasgow. Animal agriculture and the effect of diet on the climate crisis was barely mentioned. How do you feel about that? I'm disappointed. Um, maybe it was my own optimism or delusion that made me think that this would be something substantial, yeah. you know, COP26. You know, it, it was disappointing in every sense of the word, but also when we look specifically at agriculture, especially disappointing because there wasn't even really a topic of conversation. And what I found to be particularly demoralizing is that whilst nations, EU, the US and such, were debating reducing methane emissions by 30% by 2030, the US Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack mm. was talking to the press about how in the US there's no need to reduce the number of animals being farmed, that that's not, that's not a problem. So we have, this, we have this problem where our politicians are playing lip service to these issues, and we know that. You know, the environment has become finally a, a voting point. It's become something that they know will win votes, but the role of animal agriculture in the environmental crisis has not become something that will win votes. If anything, it's the opposite. So what we have now are politicians talking positively about you know, wanting to change the climate crisis that we're in and reverse it and hopefully avoid the worst effects of it because it's something that they know will appeal to voters. That, mm. That's it. I may be cynical, but it's right. true. I mean, where, where was the US government 20 years ago when Al Gore released an inconvenient truth, you know? Nowhere to be seen. Nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. But now because of Greta and these, this movement, primarily in younger people, it's now become something they've had to acknowledge as being an issue. But we're not there of the effects of animal farming yet. So it's still left off the, uh, left off the talking points. And that's a, a crime. Yeah, I think um, Biden recently, a couple of days ago, said that they're going to be putting through billions of dollars to prop up animal agriculture even more to save farms and save the meat industry from going under. Um, it kind of drives me crazy. But one of the things that a lot of kind of non-vegans kind of love to suggest is that by eating local meat, eating animals that are farmed in the, in the, in the, in the small farm down the road um, from your house is the best way to live. It's more environmentally friendly. What do you say to those people who say eating local meat makes everything fine? The concept of eating local being more sustainable only works if the systems of farming are identical. Mm. And if the only difference is the transportation the two foods have had to travel, which is just completely untrue. And there's no scientific literature to support that. When we look at beef farming and lamb farming, over 98% of the emissions caused and the damage caused by the production of, of beef and lamb is the farming itself. Mm -hmm. So that means that only 0.5 to 2% or so of the emissions is coming from the transportation. So buying beef or sheep meat from just down the road 
is not sustainable because the majority of the damage that's caused by it is from the farming. Mm. And even the notion of, of buying the same food being local doesn't always work because a couple of studies have been done, for example, the production of tomatoes. You know, buying tomatoes from Portugal was actually more sustainable for people in Sweden than buying tomatoes from Sweden because the production of tomatoes in Sweden required energy because they were being produced in, in greenhouses. So it doesn't even always work that the same food is more sustainable just because it's local. But the idea of local farming, I think, perpetuates almost a nationalistic narrative. Mm. You know, we're always told to support British farmers here. I did a BBC thing earlier today, and one of the main arguments was, well, we should support local British farmers. And that feeds into the idea that these farmers and, and their industry is worth more than, say, the soybean farmers in France who produce the tofu that we as vegans consume. Mm. And of course, th that's not true. From a moral perspective, there's no difference between the two individuals producing those foods and the support they should receive. And from an environmental perspective, producing soy in France and you know exporting it to the UK in the form of tofu and soy milk is vastly more sustainable than producing the beef. And we know that from, from the scientific literature. Mm you'll be intimately aware of reducing food's environmental impact through producers and consumers. A landmark study from, from Poronemic that was, is the most comprehensive analysis ever conducted, you know, exploring the relationship between farming and the environment. And they categorically stated, after looking at nearly 40,000 farming facilities in over 113 countries, I believe, around the world, that a plant-based diet is the most sustainable diet. Even when you factor in transport emissions and food miles, that fact still remains. People just refuse to believe it, don't they? It's... They cannot. I, I guess that it's the complexity of the food system um, that I think a lot of people struggle with. And, and we're not taught this at school. No. And in fact, we're taught the opposite because often, you know, these industries have their fingers in many educational systems. Um, my friend Matthew Friedman, who is the co-founder of Aim High Earth, a beautiful um, ac activism group, educational group, teaching people about environmentalism, educating thousands of children around the world about the planet. He has described the climate crisis as, in fact, the nature crisis or the earth crisis. Do you feel that it could be important to reframe these existential crises as something more closer to home, as Matthew does? Because it seems to, it seems to me that most people are totally ambivalent to what's going on out there in the plan, on, the, in the, on the planet, in the, in the atmosphere. They feel very removed from it. But when we talk about something as like the nature crisis or the earth crisis, you know, again, going back to effective communication, we're using language as a way to try and make it more relatable rather than these big, broad subjects with big data numbers and parts per million this and mm -hmm. these sort of things. Do you think there's much merit in the way we reframe the problem? Yeah, I think it's essential. Um, I think when we talk about issues that have a huge scope, it can be easy to, yeah, exactly, as you say, kind of take this take this huge scope and try and convey like the massive, I guess, try and view the problem in its entirety. Mm. And I think you're right in saying that sometimes simplifying and creating a more close to home opinion of these issues is important. I, I remember a few years ago, I heard someone say, you know, we always say save the planet, save the planet. But actually what we're talking about is saving ourselves. Mm. And I thought, wow, that's really powerful because mm. it's true. The planet will survive. Right. It will re, you know, regenerate and life will probably evolve out of what's regenerated here. But we won't, and unfortunately, the animals who we coexist with won't either, or at least the vast majority of them. So we're talking about saving ourselves and saving our children and our grandchildren. And um, I remember George Monbiot, he often re you know, reinforces this, and I saw he did an interview on Good Morning Britain where he became very upset when he was thinking about his children. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, that's how we can really you know, make this issue something that people resonate with by saying this isn't you know, this is kind of existential thing. This is something that maybe you don't feel the tangible effects of yet but you know millions of people around the world already are climate refugees people who have done the least to cause this problem are already suffering the consequences of what we in affluent nations continue to do mm. i think humanizing the crisis is very important it's the same with the ethical implications of veganism you know if we say to people you know we kill over 80 billion land animals and somewhere between 0.8 and 2.3 trillion marine animals every year which, which are the figures we go wow that's a big number mm. but that's all it is a number yeah and it's so huge in, in scale that we can hardly even empathize with that because it's just so abstract as a concept but if we say individuals and we think of not a, a chicken farm has been filled with you know millions of chickens, but millions of individuals each enduring their own subjective experience of that suffering. It becomes easier to empathize because we can empathize with an individual, but we can't empathize with an abstract number. Right. So I think even when we're talking about the ethics of veganism, let's focus less on the scale of the problem, but more on the individuals who are suffering as a consequence of that. 
Because even if we did it, you know, what we do to just one chicken or one pig, it would still be immoral, irrespective of whether or not we do it to 79 billion others. And so I think in the same way with the environment, I think creating that close to home, that that idea of something that we can physically empathize with, I think that's a really powerful thing to do. Mm, very well said. Um, you often talked about the Socratic method as one of your tools um, in your tool belt of communication in your interviews. Um, can you talk us through just some of the basic steps when it comes to engaging with people in, as a communicator and people out there who may want to improve? Is there, a, you know, is there some sort of anecdotes from the book that you can share about that process and how to be better at it with our friends and family? Number one, I think, is just be as educated as you can. Now, we're not ever going to know everything. And someone might say something we don't have the perfect response to. But I think before, you know, just take the time. And reading the book's a great way of doing this, you know, minus the selfless plug, right? But it is objectively a, a great way of just learning some of these arguments. Yeah. Because people will tend to say the same things over and over again. So having a good response to that's really important. So just taking some time to educate ourselves, number one. Secondly, practice. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean we have to go into conversations with non-vegan friends and family. It might mean practicing with vegans in our lives, you know, setting up like a dummy conversation. That's a good idea. You know, when actors are rehearsing their scripts, you know, they're rehearsing it with a friend, with a family member, or they're saying it out loud. They're getting used to saying and vocalizing what it is they need to say. And I think it's the same for us. It's just get used to saying what it is you want to say, because often we can know what we want to say, but actually physically saying it can be difficult. So getting used to, you know, hearing those words being vocalized and getting used to saying it can be really powerful because it means we're, we're less likely to get flustered or frustrated in a conversation when we can't get our words out properly. So practicing is important. And then I think at the same time, I, as well as practicing, I think we have to take a moment to practice listening, I suppose, as well. When we have a conversation with someone, the last thing we want to do is, is end up in an argument where we're speaking over each other progressively louder and louder and it's becoming more heated and, and flustered. That's not, what, that's not what we want. Mm. So I think practicing listening is very important. And listening allows us to dissect people's arguments further because right. we can hear the nuances of the language they're using. We can pick up on certain things they're insinuating and we can lead with that. You know, and we can try and get to understand people's emotions better. And as a consequence of that, we can ask them to reflect on what they're saying more. Mm. You know, rather than and thinking, what's my next question going to be because of what I want to say? What's my next question going to be based on what they're saying to me? Mm. So I think listening is very important. Um, you know, the empathy again aspect is very important. And validation. Now, validating again doesn't mean agreeing with someone. It just means trying to understand how they've got to that conclusion. Mm. So if someone says, you know, but you know, being vegan is very unhealthy. What about iron and, and protein? You can say, well, look, I understand why you'd be worried about that. You know, we've been told that we need to eat red meat for iron and animal products are a great source of protein. Look, I understand why you feel that way. But have you considered the fact that we can get protein and iron from plants and this is supported by the British Dietetic mm -hmm. Association, blah, blah, blah. So that validation shows that we're listening and it shows they're not being, we're not being condescending or insincere with the person. That we're empathizing and reflecting on why they've said that and not caricature caricaturing them as being an unintelligent or uneducated or you know bad because of what they're saying we're, we're understanding the the process that's allowed them to get to that point that definitely helps mm. as well as well amazing some great tips i hope you've written all of those down <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and get the book as well available on so it's available um, on, on Waterstones, mm -hmm. Amazon, and in the UK and Europe, it's available in bookstores like Waterstones, Foils, and also independent bookstores. Mm -hmm. And if it's not in your local independent bookstore, you can request for it to be stocked there, which is always super good. Mm -hmm. And in the US, it's been published on the 6th of April. So you can order it online with international delivery from places like Book Depository and Waterstones. But from the 6th of April, they'll also be available in US bookstores and on the US mm -hmm. Amazon and, and retailers as well. Amazing. On to the subject of progress over perfection. There's a lot of discussion on social media between vegans about being the perfect vegan. Um, many people actually fear adopting this lifestyle or getting involved in it because of the, the way that they are, uh, can be treated as new vegans on social media or by friends and family. What do you say to people who are terrified of becoming vegan because they're worried about this perfection uh, perfection over progress rather than progress over perfection that seems to pervade especially online as pervade our community online it's a good question i think it works both ways i think that there's an unfair expectation placed on vegans to not voice when something is wrong mm. i think when someone first goes vegan and you know maybe they aren't intimately aware of how much animal exploitation is permeated throughout society and maybe buy something they don't recognize because they've just gone vegan and make that mistake. Of course, we should point out and say, hey, just so you know, yeah. 
don't do this again. Call because, them in rather than calling them out. Exactly. But at the same time, there comes a point where people, there is an accountability that should be held on people. And that doesn't mean being, Agreed. you know, aggressive or no. rude or hostile, but it does mean pointing out people's uh, flaws in that sense. Mm. But I think accountability comes from within. Mm. And I don't think that, you know, we should view ourselves as being um, the police of others, but we should view ourselves as, as kind of that voice of accountability to right. say, look, you need to check yourself because ultimately accountability is what led us all to being vegan. Absolutely. It wasn't anyone else. You know, other people might have given us the information that led us to that point, but we processed that information and said, you know what, I do have a responsibility here to change. Mm. So I think account accountability is important. And I always encourage people to, you know, if they're in a situation where they feel like someone is criticizing them or is being cruel to them, I think it's important to not take that cruelty if it's, if it's hurting you, but at the same time reflect on why is someone saying this to me? You know, it may make me feel upset that they're saying, hey, this coat has down in it, or hey, you were vegan, now you're eating chicken again, what's that about? But it, outside of that, we have to go, well, why are they saying this? Because ultimately we have to hold ourselves accountable more than anyone else can hold us accountable. Mm, absolutely, I've, I've got a story recently, a good friend of mine who's been vegan for about seven years, um, you know, is very aware of all the issues, mm. uh, has been buying like woolen jumpers and leather shoes. And, you know, I've, I've called them out on it in, in, in the nice, in a nice way, not in a nasty, aggressive way. And yeah. they have sort of reacted with, with a sort of, you know, um, not aggressive, but being quite upset with me. I'm not the boss of them. I'm not, I shouldn't be policing their actions. You know, have you got any advice for me how to deal with this situation? Cause it's, it's obviously, it does hurt when you have a good friend or a family member who's been with you on this vegan journey for a long time and then they might start eating meat again or mm. they might start buying animal products you know what's the best way in your view to deal with something like this well i think firstly yeah, we shouldn't resort to tactics like being you know calling people names and being cruel to people and like yeah. saying things that are obviously untoward and i think vegans can fall into that trap because obviously it's such an emotional thing that when someone yeah. starts harming animals again when they don't need to of course our automatic reaction is to be like you're a terrible person and you know sometimes that may be true but ultimately is that an effective way of publicly communicating our feelings? That's not not true. Mm. So what we need to do, I think, is just you know deploy the same tactics we always have. Just why is this wrong? Why is, is was what they're doing something they shouldn't be doing? And people will react with indignation because by going, oh look, that's making me feel upset. They can try and go, oh look, I'm the victim here. Mm. And we, we all sometimes like to play the victim card and have that victim mentality because it removes the accountability that we need to have because yeah. we go, oh, look, you know, you're being mean to me. And it's like, well, actually, no, I'm just trying to hold up the mirror to yourself to say, look, you're being mean to others and this isn't something that aligns with your values. Mm. So I think it's always that question of how does this action this person's partaking in actually align with the values that they have and trying to get them to recognize there is that disalignment that has occurred. And maybe that's something you could do with your friend to say, you know, would you kill the cow yourself for that leather jacket or that, those leather shoes? You know, would you want to send the, the lamb to the slaughterhouse and pull the blade across their throat yourself for, for the wool and jacket? And if you mm. wouldn't, then you've recognized that it's not a moral thing to do. Mm. So encouraging someone to see the disconnection in their moral compass and right. the actions they're partaking in is more powerful than calling someone a name because they've done something that is obviously wrong, but was coming has made us feel emotional in a way that we're not being mm. effective anymore. Mm, absolutely. It's good advice. It's, it's a difficult thing. But, oh, yeah. But um, we, we move forward. Um, your book concludes with an afterword that simply reminds us that a vegan world would be better for everyone. What do you ultimately hope people take away after reading your book? I want people to be more educated about the benefits of veganism and the, the negative aspects of what we do to animals. So I want people to be armed with the information as to why veganism is a moral imperative and a plant-based diet is beneficial. And then I want people to understand the behavior drivers behind our actions. And the way the book is, I suppose, split up is the first section is, is about ethics. It's about what we do to animals, why that's morally wrong. The second section is about then is then about how it affects us, environment, climate change, uh, personal health, infectious diseases, pandemics. So then it's saying, look, this affects us as well. Right. So it's beyond just the moral issue for that reason. It's all of this as well. And then the first section is saying, look, this is why we act in the way that we do. This is why our behaviors um, can seem so ridiculous and seem so disconnected from our actual feelings. And this is how we can get through that. We can empower ourselves to be informed consumers and we can recognize how our behavior has been influenced by cognitive biases, by media and marketing. And then the last, the last chapter, the afterword, is really saying this is the solution. Mm. You've recognized this is a problem. You've understood, you've understood why, behaviorally speaking, we've created this problem. And this is how we fix this problem. Because I think what can often happen is people think, oh, vegans have these 
bright ideas, but what does that actually look like, tangibly speaking? And we can be criticized for not having an alternative view. Because if we're the ones going to people and saying, this is wrong, it needs to be different, we also need to teach people how it can be different and why that difference is preferable. Mm. So that the afterword is many talking about the advancements we need to make. What else can we do with that land? How can we support animal farmers as they transition out of this cruel industry? And, and that was the main focus of, of that, to say, look, this is the problem to animals. This is the problem to us. This is why we do what we do. And this is how we can change that. Amazing. I love that it's so solution focused. It's very easy to stand on rooftops screaming and shouting that you know the world's coming to an end and that animals are suffering. But it, as you say, if we don't provide solutions to the fellow humans around us, very people are very unlikely to listen. And when it's delivered in such a coherent way, I, I definitely feel like a lot of people will will listen. So thank you for this, Ed. Thank you, um, So let's move on. Um, Unity Diner, a vegan fish and chip shop in Brighton, an animal sanctuary. Honestly, how do you find the time to do all these things and not be completely burnt out? But also, how do you make sure that all these ideas and things that you're doing are being delivered effectively, um, in, uh, def delivered effectively and in ways that you really, that resonate with you as a person in your ethos in life? I, I work with amazing people. Yeah. I am so privileged to work with creative, compassionate, brilliant people, whether it's through Surge and, and the, the editors and animators that we have that create the Surge media videos, whether it's the, the wonderful people who wake up every day at the sanctuary and take care of the animals and make sure they have fresh bedding and food and make sure they're safe and well cared for. Everything that I have done outside of, you know, the book is a very personal thing, mm. but everything that you know, I've created with, with the food, with the sanctuary, has come because also has come about through cooperation with others. And I'm just, you know, so fortunate to have been able to surround myself with these kinds of people. Um, so that's really, that's the secret, I suppose, is find people who are like-minded, who are, you know, compassionate and, and who have the same values as you and see how you can work together to create, you know, a bigger impact. And that's what I've been fortunate enough to be able to do, you know, since fairly early on in this process. Mm. And do you ever suffer burnout because you're involved in so many different things? If you, and, and if you do, how do you deal with it? I mean, sometimes I, I wake up and I'm like, oh, another, you know, another day of thinking about this and talking about this and, and dealing with this. But the way to get around that I've always found is to not lose touch with other things I enjoy. Mm. Veganism is my life. Mm. It's my work. It's my passion. It's the thing I care most about. But at the same time, it's not my whole identity. Mm. You know, I have an identity outside of veganism, someone who enjoys, you know, going out for food, someone who enjoys, who enjoys listening to music, who likes watching films and going to the cinema. That's also part of my identity, enjoying these other aspects of my life. And so I think we shouldn't feel guilt or shame in, in making time for other aspects of our lives that we enjoy and, and form our identity as well. And that's what I've learned um, is to, you know, take an evening off and, and put a film on, go to the cinema, watch a TV series, whatever it might be, mm. you know, if you're an artist to, to paint something that's not vegan related, whatever it might be, to find that space from thinking about veganism and the brutality of what happens every day is so important because as you say, without it, the, the burnout can creep in. And you know, I've had moments where I felt just so terribly exhausted because of it, but then you just take a moment to recharge mm -hmm. and uh, that, that keeps me going for sure. Amazing. Tell us a little bit about the sanctuary. So who lives there? Tell us about some of the lovely fluffy creatures, any of their names or stories. Yeah, we have, I think now over 130 residents at the wow. sanctuary, um, ducks, chickens, pigs, cows. We have a, an eclectic mix of characters and personalities. And it's, it's a really wonderful, uh, a really wonderful thing to see, I suppose, just this union of different species of animals coexisting. It, it's, it's kind of marvelous to see how the pigs interact with the sheep and the chickens interact with the, with the ducks and such. And this, this community that's forming within the animals as well. We've got a, a couple of really touching stories, such as Matilda the pig. Matilda escaped from a pig farm when she was mm. pregnant and gave birth to her oh. piglets in, in a woods nearby the farm. Uh, fortunately, a, a dog walker spotted them and alerted a, a nearby animal rescue called Brinsley Animal Rescue to what Matilda had done and where she was. And after a, a process of negotiation with the farmer, the farmer accepted um, or uh, relinquished, let's say, not that you can relinquish ownership of, of another being, but allowed Brinsley to to take in Matilda, who was then rehomed with us. And the, the story was a, a national story. It was in the BBC and such. Talking yeah, I think about, we covered it as well, didn't I we? I think you yeah. did, yeah, yeah, talking about Matilda and her maternal desire to raise her children in safety and the fact that she'd broken out of this farm to try and find li liberate herself and mm. as a consequence liberate her children was, I think, a very profound story. We also have some rescued some rescued cows. These are some older ladies a little bit in the mm -hmm. twilight years, some of them. And they come from this farm 
where they'd been kept inside for a couple of years and they were living in 20 inches of feces and dirt. And the farmer had, had lost, they had no money basically. And I think the female farmer's husband had left her and left her with these cows that she had no money to, to do anything you know, to support anymore. So she sent a bunch of them to slaughter, sadly enough. And then she had these this group of older ladies who she'd spent, I guess, a lot of time with who she didn't want to send to slaughter. Mm. And so she let us take them and, and now they live at the sanctuary with us. But that story, I think, reveals a certain interesting attitude that we have towards animals and even farmers. You know, she sent some of these cows to slaughter because she didn't have a connection with them. So mm. she'd assigned their worth as being less than these other female cattle, these other cows, because she had a relationship with these other cows. And I think it speaks to the power of connection with animals. And I think that's why sanctuaries are so important because it's like I was saying earlier about creating this impression of individuals. That's what sanctuaries do. They show animals as being individuals. What we do often is we create abstractions of, of the animals who we farm, you know, chickens, chickens are this way, cows, cows are this way. Mm. But sanctuaries and the stories that we can tell from sanctuaries reinforce that even within these species, there's a uniqueness to the individuals. You know, one cow maybe like scratches behind the ear and another cow doesn't. This chicken likes broccoli, but this chicken doesn't. Mm. And it reveals the, the complexity of these sentient beings. And that's why I think is very powerful about sanctuaries it's not just the rehoming and rescuing of these animals and the avoidance of the slaughter they were going to endure it's the fact that we can now tell these stories and show to people look mm. daisy the cow is like this you know the matilda the pig is like this eric the sheep is like this mm. and people can connect with and respond and empathize mm. with these individuals and as a consequence recognize that there are other individuals who are very similar in the ways that matter morally mm. who are still being exploited Absolutely. And that's such an important point to make that that connection that people make with animals is the realization that animals are individuals like us with their own inner worlds, thoughts and feelings. They see the world that, like we do, some in in with a lot more color and in really complex and fascinating ways. Um, it's really beautiful. I can't wait to visit. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get myself a little electric car at some point soon. Um, really excited to get it because I've never really wanted to get a car in London, yeah. but um, I'm really keen to get myself in a car this year, a little electric one, and go around the country and visit sanctuaries and get out of London a little bit more. So yeah. I'll definitely make sure I pay the sanctuary a visit. You definitely should. So just a couple of questions from our audience that came in. There's lots of random ones, but these these two just sort of stand out to me. One person, so her, their name was X-I-A-X-X-X. -X -X, okay, and, yeah. and they said, I would love to see your book in Chinese. Is there any chance that it'll be translated? I really hope so. Um, so the publisher has translation rights. Mm -hmm. And so I think once it's been published here and we've had the run here and, and, and in the US as well, um, hopefully discussion will turn to translation because I would love for it to be translated into other European languages as well. But ultimately, yeah, I think yeah. get into the Chinese market and, and you know, Spanish as well in South America and having people be able to read it in their native tongue, I think is very important. Yeah. So fingers crossed, although I can't 100% sure. confirm it currently. Next question was um, from Ida Miami, who says, would you ever go on the Joe Rogan podcast? If I was invited, yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely. There is a lot of interesting stuff that Joe and I could talk about, no mm -hmm. doubt. Um, and so I definitely would if the invitation was ever put in front of me. Do you think you could ever convince him to go vegan? No, probably not. <laughs> I think there was a time where I maybe deluded myself into thinking that he wasn't as bad as he is when it comes to these issues. But I think especially in the past 18 months or so, he showed himself to not be the sort of person that would probably make that change. Yeah. Um, and he's become potentially more entrenched in his values. You know, he had James Wilkes on, the yeah. producer and uh, the, the guy in Game Changers, who, was, who just did phenomenally well on the Joe Rogan podcast. He obliterated Chris Cresser, the, the chiropractor, who uh, likes to think he's an expert in all things mm. medicine related, but he obliterated him. I don't think Chris Cress has been back on the Joe Rogan podcast since, but even Joe himself was like, yeah, he made some really great points. Mm. And it feels to me like after that, he's almost become more entrenched in his views, that mm. he, he saw almost the vulnerability in his belief system mm. and his attitude he's towards down. needs. Yeah, he's doubled down, mm. I think. And I, so I'd love to have a crack at it, but I wouldn't necessarily be confident that I would be the, the catalyst for him changing, but maybe his audience, some if of them. anyone who's listening knows Joe, please get Ed on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Ed Witters, thank you so much for joining us on the PBN podcast. What a pleasure to sit down with you again, my friend. Thank you so much, Robbie, for the great conversation. It's wonderful to, to see you again. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I've been your host, Robbie Lockie, and this is the PBN podcast. We'll be back next time with more food, fashion, animals, technology, and everything in between. Mm -hmm.